ah, Christmas. A time of hope and peace, a time of reflection and calmness. A time even during war, opposing soldiers can put down their weapons and exchange gifts as they did during the famous Christmas truce in 1914. Thirty years later, Allied powers and the Germans found themselves again facing off in the dead of winter. This time, however, there would be no truce. The brutal fighting between the two sides in the Ardennes Forest, commonly known as the Battle of the Bulge, spanned from December 16, 1944 through January 25, 1945, resulting in many Christmases being spent without shelter, food, or proper winter clothing. This is Glasses, and that was my pal, The Glider, coming to you from Lubbock, Texas, home of the Buddy Holly Center and the Silent Wings Museum. Thanks for tuning in to the first episode of Wings of War, arriving in the Ardennes. Recording from the Silent Wings Museum, this is our first and hopefully a long series of podcasts that will deal largely with World War II, the American Military Glider Program, and the collection at this museum, located at 6202 North I-27. If you enjoy this, please check out our sister podcast, Frames and Fame, where we talk about Buddy Holly and early rock and roll. If you didn't like it, share it with your worst enemies. Don't worry, we won't tell them. Now, something that very few people are aware of is that the United States had a military, expressly an assault glider program, that was active during the course of World War II. This program was used at different times throughout the war, delivering supplies, ammunition, gasoline, doctors, or even an escape for wounded soldiers. The glider support effort of the airborne troops stationed in the Ardennes encompassed all of these tasks, often aiding in critical times during the battle. On December 16, 1944, the Germans launched an all-out offensive to the west in order to try and break the rapid Allied advance through Western Europe. The American troops tasked with holding this portion of Belgium were caught unaware and unprepared due to a few reasons. Number one, the terrain. The Ardennes was an ideal position to defend. The densely wooded highland and deep river valleys, coupled with relatively small and sparse roads, made it difficult for an army with significant armored units to march effectively through the space. Number two, faulty intelligence. The Allies had intelligence that informed them that the bordering German territory was being used for a rest and refit area for their troops. And finally, fatigue. After D-Day, the Allies had been advancing at a fervent pace, leaving many troops weary and with an ever-decreasing amount of provisions, ammunition, and medical supplies. The failure of the Allies to capture a serviceable deep-water port compounded the supply shortage, this forced the Americans to rely solely on over-the-beach supply trains that were unable to meet the demand of the increased invasion force. The initial German assault consisted of over 406,000 troops, 1,200 tanks, tank destroyers, assault guns, and 4,500 artillery pieces. Hitler's plan was to bust through the poorly manned Ardennes to Antwerp route and split the British and American forces. This would ideally force a separate peace agreement between the Western powers and the Third Reich, leaving the Soviets without major allies in the West. He viewed the Western allies as weak and only truly respected the Red Army as an opposing force. A large reason behind this line of thinking was that the Eastern Front had cost the Germans exponentially more manpower, resources, and time while fighting primarily the Russians. While the Germans had struggled in the East, they controlled almost all of Western Europe by 1940, only truly falling short in England. The recent victory on D-Day was the first foothold the Allied powers had in the West since the fall of France. Because of this, Hitler believed that a major offensive to the West gave him a greater chance of taking ground and would perhaps allow him to negotiate terms while still having some sort of leverage. Many of Hitler's commanders believed that Antwerp was too ambitious a goal, but he refused to listen to their advice. The order was given and the stage was set for the Americans' bloodiest battle of the war. The Americans were severely outmanned and outgunned when the Germans sprung this attack, initially having only 80,000 troops and little to no armored units to support them. 
As you might know from the critically acclaimed series Band of Brothers, the 101st Airborne was holed up at Bastogne, while the 99th Infantry Division was to the north at Elsenborn Ridge. What the show did not cover, however, was the crucial role that the gliders and aircraft played in resupplying the 101st and aiding the destruction of the 12th SS Panzer Battalion that was besieging the 99th. Without this critical air support, the Germans may have been able to break through the American lines. Gliders carried in more than just ammo and gas to Bastogne. Although both of those things were critical to the success of the Allied defense, they also carried in doctors. After 10 days of artillery bombardment and constant fighting, on December 26, the Americans loaded 10 gliders to come in to the aid of the 101st. While they carried 5 doctors, 4 medical technicians, and 2,975 gallons of 80 octane gasoline. While receiving some enemy fire, all 10 gliders made it into the perimeter of the surrounded city. Despite some American advancements throughout the 26th, there was still not enough headway made to resupply the troops via ground transportation. Thus, on December 27th, provisions and medics were added to the 40 other gliders loaded with ammunition and the 200 C-47s that were dropping in other ammunition and supplies to the American troops. 17 of the gliders were brought down by German fire, but 33 made it to the resupply area relatively undamaged. This resupply, along with the medical aid, allowed for the American troops to hold off the Germans until General Eisenhower came through with reinforcements. The 50 gliders may seem paltry when compared to the massive amount of other support vehicles and troops, but in reality, these 50 gliders provided the support that allowed the Americans enough strength to continue to push back the Germans. These missions may have all been for naught, however, if the 99th Infantry had been overrun at Elsenborn Ridge. This portion of the Allied defense was the only group to not give up any ground during the course of the battle. While Bastogne is infamous for holding out while surrounded and outnumbered by the German army, Elsenborn Ridge is often overlooked. The Germans committed their best armored unit, the 12th Panzer, as well as nine other divisions to that one specific area of their offensive. The goal was to break through and seize Antwerp in order to separate the British and American forces, hopefully beginning the peace talks when the town was captured. The 12th Panzer unit did not consist of just regular troops. No, this unit was part of Hitler's personal detail, made up of graduates from the Hitler Youth, veterans from the Eastern Front, and trusted officers. Hitler tasked this elite unit with the daunting mission of leading the attack on the ridge and essentially becoming the tip of the spear that would retake Allied-occupied Antwerp. However, the massive amounts of American artillery on the ridge made it nearly impossible to assault even with the Germans having twice as many troops as the Americans. That number, however, does not truly express the disadvantageous position of the courageous 99th. The Nazis had strategically organized their troops so that in breakthrough areas, they outnumbered the Americans by as much as 6 to 1. The fighting was fierce, but the Americans relied on their artillery and bravery, destroying the Panzer unit and turning back the advance. When the advance on Elsenborn Ridge failed, there were almost no reinforcements that could come to the aid of the Germans who had surrounded the town of Bastogne. Bastogne was crucial to the German offensive because it was at the crossroads of seven different roads that went to various parts of Belgium, including the final destination of Antwerp. By December 21st, the trapped American forces no longer had any clear way out of Bastogne. People that were in the town often helped out the soldiers most frequently as medical practitioners. During this offensive, nurses and doctors were crucial to both sides treating the wounded. Frostbite was especially prevalent. 17,000 Germans from the 1st, 3rd, and 7th armies were hospitalized due to cold. The under-equipped allies were fighting two enemies, the Germans and the Winter. One nurse in particular was Augusta Chue, often referred to as the Forgotten Angel of Bastogne. Augusta Chue was a volunteer nurse who worked with the United States Army during the siege of Bastogne. 
She was born in the Belgian Congo in 1921 and moved to Belgium at an early age. At 19, she became a nurse. When the Germans launched their final offensive on December 16, 1944, Augusta had just returned home to see her parents for Christmas, who were living in the town of Bastogne. The Germans attacked the town, and fierce fighting took place. Augusta was on the front lines, wearing a U.S. uniform, no less, helping treat the wounded along with other nurses and doctors. Because she was wearing a uniform, if captured, she would have been executed as an enemy combatant. During the battle, the Germans bombed the aid station she had been working at. Augusta was thrown through a wall, but thankfully survived. Sadly, more than 30 others died. At the time, U.S. Army regulations forbade nurses of color from giving medical treatment to white soldiers. Augusta ignored this rule, favoring human life over trivial legalities. The siege lasted over seven days, reducing the town of Bestone to rubble. Thankfully, in less than a year, the war had ended. After the war, Augusta continued to work as a nurse in Belgium and eventually married and had two children. Even though she rarely spoke of war, her courage and bravery were not forgotten. Knighted in Belgium in 2011, Chue also received the Civilian Award for Humanitarian Services by the U.S. Department of the Army. Augusta passed away on August 23, 2015, at the age of 94. On December 26th, General George Patton and the 4th Armored Division broke through the German lines, allowing relief for the weary troops. The Allies then launched a counteroffensive led by Patton to push the Germans back behind their original lines. The fighting continued for the next month, finally stopping at the end of January. The battle cost over 19,000 Americans their lives and wounded 70,000 more. While the Germans paid an even dearer price, losing between 67,000 and 125,000 soldiers, there were approximately 3,000 civilians that were killed during the course of the battle, most at Bastogne. The gliders played a crucial role in the battle, especially in resupplying the encircled 101st Airborne at Bastogne. They aided in stopping the Germans' desperate push at the end of the war, and only a few months later, on May 8th, Germany surrendered. The Battle of the Bulge cost thousands of American soldiers their lives, millions of civilians their loved ones, and entire countries their hope on Christmas. The fighting was brutal and without mercy, and Americans and Germans alike were robbed of the joy of being home at Christmas. Today, many of us will complain about annoying family members or take for granted the time that we get to spend in our warm houses with full stomachs. These are the privileges we are afforded because of the sacrifices of those men and women. So this Christmas, take a moment to think about what those people gave up. Then treasure the time that you will spend at home or abroad, because no matter what, at least you're not in the Ardennes in 1944. Thanks for listening to episode one of Wings of War. This is Glasses and the Glider saying so long from 1944. Tune in next month for the second installment. Until then, so long and have a happy holiday.